안녕하십니까. 삼성언론재단 상임이사 민병기입니다. 삼성언론재단이 주관하고 한국기자협회, 한국언론학회가 공동으로 주최하는 오늘 컨퍼런스에 많은 분들께서 참석해 주셔서 대단히 감사합니다. 한국저널리즘 컨퍼런스는 언론이 본연의, 본연의 가치를 높이는 데 조금이나마 도움이 되고자 2016년부터 시작되었습니다. 특히 오늘 이 자리에는 현직 언론인뿐만 아니라 저널리즘을 전공하는 교수님 및 학생분들이 많이 참석해 주셨습니다. 관심과 성원에 다시 한번 깊이 감사드립니다. 오늘 컨퍼런스는 주제 발표 그리고 프리드먼 교수와의 대화 질의응답 순으로 진행될 예정입니다. 먼저 진행과 주제 발표를 해주실 두 분을 소개해 드리겠습니다. 전체 진행을 맡아주실 분은 이와이대 커뮤니케이션 미디어학부의 박성희 교수님입니다. 콜롬비아 대학에서 사회학을 전공하셨고 퍼듀 대학에서 언론학 박사를 하셨습니다. 교수께서는 기자로서도 오랫동안 활동하셨으며 현재도 많은 칼럼을 기고하고, 기고하고 있습니다. 다음으로 오늘 이 자리를 위해 홍케이 미국에서 오신 콜롬비아 대 저널리즘 스쿨 세뮤얼 프리드먼 교수를 소개하겠습니다. 교수님은 위스콘신 대학에서 저널리즘과 역사를 전공하셨고 뉴욕타임스 기자로 활동하셨으며 현재에도 뉴욕타임즈의 종교, 문화, 교육 등 다양한 분야에서 칼럼을 기고하고 있습니다. 또한 많은 저술 활동을 통해 작가로도 잘 알려져 있죠. 대표적으로는 미래의 저널리스트에게 유대인 대 유대인 등이 있습니다. 특히 미래의 저널리스트에게는 한국어로도 번역이 되어 우리에게 잘 알려져 있기도 합니다. 그럼 세미얼 프리드먼 교수의 강연을 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. Good evening, and thank, thank you all for turning out to hear this speech. I'm deeply moved to look out and see the next generation of journalism, journalism in Korea and journalism around the world being represented here. And I'm also grateful beyond words to the Samsung Press Foundation um, and its many, uh, its many collaborators in the universities here in Seoul um, for doing everything they could do to bring me over here. It's truly one of the honors of my teaching life and my journalistic life to be able to come and be with you and to have these important discussions across thousands of miles of geograph geographical distance across linguistic differences, but to know that there's so much that we share, there's so much that unites us as journalists. The format for tonight, I, I think you know, is that I will speak formally for the first 15 or 20 minutes, and then I'll be in, in dialogue with Dr. Park and be able to take, I hope, many of the questions that you have, because When I looked at even some of the early questions that were sent to me uh, through the Samsung uh, Press Foundation, what struck me right away is these are exactly the same questions that journalists in the United States are asking right now. Young journalists are asking them, and also old journalists like me are asking them. So I know that the conversation we we're having together is absolutely important, and I hope that it will be the beginning of a fruitful and mutually helpful ongoing dialogue. And I hope that someday I'll see some of you young people as my graduate students at Columbia. I have to say that I've had, over my almost 30 years there, a number of outstanding Korean and Korean American students. So the path has been opened for you when you want to come to Columbia. But now to speak more formally. 
In the late summer of 1969, when I was 13 years old and starting high school, my mother gave me my first typewriter. It was a heavy iron black machine that required me to strike the keys very forcefully. My mother thought I should start typing up my assignments for school, which I did, but I also used that typewriter to write the first articles I submitted to my high school newspaper. The funny thing is that I never learned how to type correctly. Back in 1969, in my high school, you could only take a typing class if you were a girl training to be a secretary. I was in a curriculum aimed at academic preparation for college, so I had no choice but to teach myself to type. For the first year or so, I did it with one finger, the index finger on my left hand since I am left-handed. Then I was able to start using the index finger of my right hand, a great step forward for me. At one time toward the end of my high school years, I bought an instruction book with diagrams of the keyboard and exercises to teach you how to type with it, with all 10 fingers. It was a method called touch typing. But the process of following the diagrams and doing the exercises made me so slow that I reverted back to my two fingers. I am now 63 years old, and I still type with just two fingers. And I still hit the keys with a lot of force. Several times when I've been typing on an airplane flight, the passenger in front of me has turned around to ask me to stop typing so noisily. Over my years as a journalist, my way of typing is one of the few parts of my professional life that has stayed constant. I've gone from newsrooms that used early desktop computers to some of the first portable computers, which weren't even called laptops yet, to the era of smartphones, the internet, and social media. I've gone from being part of a news industry in the United States that was intensely concentrated in three major television networks, several general interest magazines with circulations in the tens of millions, and dominant national newspapers like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I've gone from that to a news industry that is splintered and fragmented into an immense and ever-growing number of publications, most of which operate online. It can be reassuring for me to still type up my own articles with two fingers, because that simple action reminds me that even as so many elements of journalism have changed with advances in technology and changes in the marketplace, some important aspects of our work should not change. A former colleague of mine at Columbia Journalism School, Professor Sig Gissler, who is also the administrator in charge of the Pulitzer Prizes, created a word to describe the ideal mix of old and new. He said today's journalist should be tradigital. You cannot find that word in any dictionary. Professor Gissler made it up. But here is what it means. Tra is from the word traditional. And digital is, of course, the word we use when we talk about digital technology, the digital revolution, and so on. Professor Gissler's tradigital journalist is someone who keeps the best part of the journalistic tradition while also being familiar with the newest technologies and making use of them to gather and share news. At my age, I have many longtime friends in journalism who complain that the internet, social media, cable television, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, are ruining journalism. They think the professionals have been outnumbered by the amateurs. They complain about the number of journalists who've been laid off from their jobs and the number of newspapers that have closed down. These complaints do have some merit, but for most of my years as a professional journalist, there has always been a sense that the good old days are over, that the golden age was somewhere in the past. For example, after I graduated from college in 1977, I had a summer job on the Minneapolis Star. At that time, Minneapolis had two competing newspapers, 
the Tribune published in the morning, and the Star in the afternoon. It was very typical for major American cities back then to have at least two newspapers. But the growing audience for evening newscasts on television was reducing the number of readers and buyers for afternoon newspapers. Many of them began to close. And in 1982, the Minneapolis Star became one of them. I was not on the paper then, but a friend of mine saved the last edition for me. In it, one of the Star's columnists wrote in a very emotional tone that when you see afternoon newspapers closing and major cities having only one daily newspaper, then you know that American journalism is dying. Well, here we are 41 years later, and journalism is not dead at all. Yes, there have been closings and layoffs, but thanks to the digital revolution, there are also hundreds or even thousands of journalism startups that are hiring tens of thousands of young reporters, editors, photographers, web designers, and videographers. In the early 1980s, when I was working on a newspaper in the suburbs of Chicago, I had to drive to the one local store that carried the Sunday edition of the New York Times if I, want, if I wanted to read it on a Sunday. If I was just a few minutes too late, all of the five copies would have been bought already and there was no New York Times for me. Now, thanks to the digital revolution, I can read the New York Times on my laptop or my smartphone, it's a Samsung, on, on my smartphone virtually anywhere in the world. When the London subway was bombed in 2005, I could read coverage instantly from the BBC and The Guardian. When Israel and Hezbollah fought a war in the summer of 2006, I could read the coverage from both Lebanese and Israeli English language newspapers while sitting at my desk in Manhattan. The access all of us have now is extraordinary. And the digital tools to report are extraordinary too. The movement against police brutality in the United States, called the Black Lives Matter movement, was made possible by the use of smartphones. Civilians who witnessed or experienced brutality from police officers were able to make video recordings, which were then made available to journalists. Search engines like Google if used wisely, have made it far more efficient to do research. Being online is like having membership in the world's largest and greatest library. Social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter allow journalists to locate sources almost anywhere in the world and to publish their work to a global audience. So I am convinced that more great journalism is being produced now than at any time that I've ever lived, and probably at any other time in human history. And the efforts of President Trump to attack the American media as the enemy of the people and to call our product fake news have had an unexpected effect. Yes, many of his supporters believe him, but much of the public values a free press more than ever before because it feels endangered. Online subscriptions for newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post have grown rapidly in the Trump years. And, this, and many of my students at Columbia have gone into journalism precisely because the president's campaign against journalism and journalists proves to these young people, and maybe to you too, how important and necessary the news media is. There is a phrase in American journalism, or in, there is a phrase rather in American jargon, that you can look at a glass of water as being half full or half empty. I've just given you the half full version of journalism in the digital era. Now, let me give you the half empty version. By that, I mean the challenges posed to journalism by the digital revolution. In terms of the economics of the news industry, the digital revolution has created a far more competitive market than ever before and has disrupted the revenue streams that had sustained major newspapers and magazines. 
classified advertising, the small ads about an apartment to rent or a bicycle for sale, things like that. Classified advertising has moved to free sites like Craigslist. Display advertising from large businesses like airlines, restaurants, and clothing stores was placed in targeted online portals rather than on the printed pages in publications. Readers who used to have no choice but to pay for a publication if they wanted to read it could now click their way to free views online. Or more recently, they follow Twitter tweets or Facebook posts to the articles that interest them. It is no wonder then that news organizations have struggled to find new ways to financially survive. At the outset of the digital era, some tried paywalls, which failed largely because consumers were not yet accustomed to paying simply to view content on a computer. Then, news organizations tried making all their content free and available in the hope that so many readers would come to the website that advertisers would follow. But not enough advertisers in enough volume ever did follow. Instead, many put their ads on aggregating sites like Yahoo rather than on any news organization's own site. And finally, in the last few years, major newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post have succeeded with partial paywalls that offer a very low starting price, usually about $1 a week, and access to about 10 articles a month free. But newspapers without the national or international impact of the Times or the Post have not had similar success. The challenge to the traditional business models during the digital era has been paralleled by the challenge to traditional journalistic standards. In the United States, you don't need, rather in the United States, you need a license and a specific course of study to take on many occupations, doctor, lawyer, real estate agent, teacher, financial advisor, even cosmetologist. But there has never been any form of licensing or required education for journalists. The advantage of that lack of control is that the government cannot use licenses as a way of restricting freedom of the press. The disadvantage is that it has been left up to journalists themselves to establish best practices and ethical standards. When the news media was more concentrated just 20 or 25 years ago, it was easier to establish an informal consensus. That consensus believed that journalists should be impartial and nonpartisan, should accurately and honestly report facts, and should restrict opinion to clearly marked opinion pages. News organizations as a whole saw their role as helping to create the informed citizens who are necessary for a healthy democracy. Needless to say, the news media often fell short of those goals, but at least there was a good faith effort to meet them. There's an old joke that says freedom of the press belongs only to people who can afford to buy a printing press. And it is true that in the pre-internet years, it took a tremendous amount of money to operate a newspaper or a magazine or radio station or a, TV or a TV station. Diverse voices were not present. The voice of American journalism then was the voice of the straight white male. But on the other hand, amateurs and ideologues could not as easily set up shop. The digital revolution changed all of that. Anyone able to design a website or later to open up a social media account, could start functioning as a journalist. And online, that person's work would be as readily accessible as the work of a trained, experienced, professional journalist on a respected, long-standing news organization. Some startup sites were terrific. Others were deeply flawed, inaccurate, barely edited, poorly written. And still others were essentially political or ideological movements pretending to be news organizations. The former senator and diplomat, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, once said, everybody is permitted to his own opinion. 
but nobody is permitted to his own facts. Or nobody, I'm sorry, everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but nobody is entitled to his own facts. Unfortunately, in the era of online journalism and social media, at least in the United States, a great many people believe they are entitled to their own facts. My nation is deeply divided these days, more divided than I've ever seen it in my life, in part because there is no longer a national narrative, a set of public facts and truths. Liberals and Democrats tend to rely on carefully edited and fact-checked news organizations like The Times, The Post, CNN, and National Public Radio. But conservatives and Republicans get their information primarily from right-wing media such as Breitbart, Fox News, and The Daily Caller. At the level of the individual journalist, the challenge of being tradigital is to hold on to the values we consider sacred, even when those values are under attack, especially when those values are under attack. We must be more committed than ever to searching out and verifying facts. We must be vigilant in putting aside our own political beliefs when reporting on issues. We must not let opinion seep into news coverage. We must always remember, in this time when every news organization is on deadline every second of every day, competing against every other news organization in the world, we must remember that it is better to get a story right than it is to upload a story first. Factual errors fly around the internet instantaneously, and even if they are later corrected, the damage caused by inaccurate information cannot be undone. After two terrorists set off a bomb at the Boston Marathon several years ago, a totally unfounded rumor went around online that a particular college student was a suspect. Legitimate professional journalists for several TV networks retweeted and forwarded that report, which made it seem even more legitimate. In fact, the college student was missing from his family and was later found to have committed suicide. He had absolutely nothing to do with the bombing. The ease of doing research online is a great boon to journalists, but also a potential trap. In cyberspace, we do not know who we're really talking to. That problem became especially vivid during the early months of the peaceful protests against Bashar al-Assad's regime in Syria. A lot of news organizations in Europe and the United States did not keep reporters in Syria, partly because of the cost and partly because of the danger. So when a blogger using the name Gay Girl in Damascus started posting the inside story of political activists like herself, publications began quoting her dispatches without ever confirming her identity. Then one day, the cousin of Gay Girl in Damascus posted through the account that the blogger had been arrested and taken away by the Syrian secret police. The cousin asked Western journalists to demand the release of Gay Girl, and many news organizations did so. Only then did a few skeptics try to determine who Gay Girl in Damascus actually was. Her online photo, it turned out, had been stolen from the social media account of another woman. Gay girl in Damascus was finally revealed to be a straight white guy from America who had created the online persona because he felt sympathetic to the pro-democracy demonstrators. I don't blame him for being a fake. I blame us journalists for being too complacent to make sure gay girl was real. So both the opportunities and the obstacles abound for doing responsible and ethical journalism in the digital era. But one thing I do know is that when something is scarce, it becomes more valuable. That is the economic principle of supply and demand. And when our readers, viewers, and listeners feel surrounded by versions of journalism that are blatantly biased or, to, or indifferent to accuracy and factuality, 
they will value the best kind of journalism more than ever. And we are, you are, the very fortunate people who can provide it to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, being for being here with us today and for inspiring speech just now. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you. I would like to use that text in my writing class. <laughs> would you allow me to introduce yourself again, you again in my version? Okay, 제가 다시 한번 소개를 좀 드리겠습니다. 앞서 민병 기사께서 소개를 해주셨지만, 어, 우리 프리드만 교수님을 소개하는 여러 수식어들이 있습니다. 근데 아마 저한테 한 마디로 교수님을 소개해라라고 한다면, 저는 어, 진짜 언론인이다 이렇게 소개를 드리고 싶어요. 어, 요즘 같은 미디어 지형에서 우리는 정말 여러 종류의 언론과 다양한 종류의 언론인들을 보고 삽니다. 그 중에는 적당한 진짜와 적당한 가짜들이 섞여 있죠. 아마도 대부분은 그러나 우리 사회에서 언론이라는 게 어떤 역할을 해야 하는지 고민하고 또 진짜 언론이 되기 위해서 많은 고민과 함께 해답을 찾기 위해서 노력하는 분들이라고 생각합니다. 그리고 오늘 이 자리에 오신 분들 특히 신청을 하셔서 오신 분들은 그런 의문을 가지고 또 뭔가 해답을 찾으러 오셨다고 생각을 합니다. 그런 분들에게 가장 현명한 길을 제시해 주실 가장 적절한 분을 모셨다고 저는 생각합니다. 에, 조금 더 소개를 드리면요. 여기 아까 어, 고등학교 시절에 이제 타이프라이터를 가지고 기자를 시작하셨다고 했는데 사실은 하이스쿨이라고 하셨는데 주니어 하이거든요. 그게 중학교예요. 우리로 치면. 8학년입니다. 그러니까 중2. 그러니까 대부분의 학생들이 중2병을 앓을 때 그때 언론계에 입사를 이제 입문을 하셨습니다. 그리고 그때 이제 어머니께서 주신 타이프라이터를 사용하셨다고 했는데 그 어머니께서 원래 언론인이 되시고 싶어 했다고 합니다. 어, 그리고 18살에 처음으로 인턴 기자가 되셔서 어, 처음 월급을 받는 기자로 언론계에 들어오신 후에 지금까지 언론인으로 또 언론을 가르치는 교수님으로 어, 칼럼니스트로 어서로 활동을 해 오셨습니다. 근데 지금까지 여덟 권의 책을 쓰셨는데요. 그 책들은 전부 그 non-fiction 단행본. 그러니까 미국 사회의 그 어떤 깊은 문제점들을 파고들어서 치열하게 취재하고 그 다음에 아주 명료한 글로 써낸 저널리즘의 정수가 담긴 그런 책들입니다. 그래서 이제 그런 지금은 이제 콜롬비아 대학 저널리즘 스쿨에서 미디어 윤리 그리고 non-fiction book writing이라는 과목을 가르치시고 있다고 합니다. 제가 첫 질문은요. 좀 가벼운 질문으로 시작할까 합니다. 어, 중학교 2학년 때 언론계에 입문을 하셨는데 어떤 어린 시절을 보내셨기에 그렇게 이른 나이에 이 험한 언론계에 들어오실 생각을 하셨는지 어떠한 어린이였는지 좀그 어린 시절에 대해서 말씀을 해주시죠. Uh, Dr. Park, as you yourself said, my mother was uh, someone who wanted to be a journalist. She grew up in a poor working family as the eldest child during the Depression. And so although she was able to go to college, instead of being able to study to become a journalist, she had to work days, go to school at night, and take a more practical course, which became business. So I felt even as a child, the, some of the incentive of fulfilling her dreams for her life. But also, more generally, both of my parents were very avid about following political issues. Uh, it was the year of the Vietnam War, of the Civil Rights Movement. These things were discussed at our dinner table at home every day. And my brother and sister and I, if we had something intelligent to say, were encouraged to join the adult conversations. So I had an awareness of the larger world from really nine or 10 years old. And interestingly also, the first job I ever had was to deliver the local newspaper. 
And it happened to be during the year 1968, which was a very traumatic, difficult year in America, a year with the most deaths in the Vietnam War, a year when Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King were both assassinated. And it was very powerful as I would go every afternoon after school and deliver the 70 newspapers I delivered in my hometown to see both how people depended on getting the news and sometimes how crushing it was for them to get the news. But people I knew would look in the newspaper right after I gave it to them at the list of that week's casualties in the Vietnam War to see if someone they knew had been killed. The day Robert Kennedy was killed, a mother who I delivered the newspaper to had tears in her eyes and said to me, how can they even put out the newspaper today? Because the tragedy was so awful. And so I think that also gave me a real sense of the importance of journalism at this very young age. And in terms of what kind of kid I was, I didn't feel like I was such an unusual uh, kid, except unusual in the sense that at age 13, I had already figured out pretty much what I wanted to do with my life. But I was a kid who liked to play sports and, you know, listen to the radio, you know, for music and, you know, not wear braces and all that. And reading as well, right? And you reading like, very avidly. Reading. <laughs> I liked the incident where you had to read a newspaper in a, in a car to your daddy. Yes, so thanks for reminding me. Yes. My father uh, worshipped the New York Times. He, and often he would take my brother and I on trips to go skiing, and it took us about three or four or five hours to go from our part of New Jersey up to where the mountains were, And on the way, he would often give me the New York Times from that morning and tell me which articles to read aloud to him. And so that also gave me this real appreciation for journalism. And I think in a way I didn't even realize at the time, when you're reading good writing aloud, it's a way of teaching yourself how to write. 부모님께서 정말 큰 역할을 하신 것 같다는 생각을 저도 했습니다. 지금 말씀을 듣고. 2006년도에 교수님께서 쓰신 Letters to a Young Journalist 그 책이 우리나라에도 2년 후에 2008년에 번역이 돼서 많은 독자들을 끌었고 또 많은 공감을 불러일으켰습니다. 근데 그 책이 중국어로도 번역이 됐다고 합니다. 근데 이제 교수님께서는 미국 분이시고 또 미국 언론 환경에서 이 책을 집필하신 걸로 알고 있습니다. 또 그래서 이 The Letters to Young Journalist라는 것을 쓰실 때는 그 Young Journalist 안에는 한국이나 중국의 저널리스트는 없었을 것 같습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 이런 언어와 그 문화적인 장벽을 넘어서서 그들의 공감을 얻게 한 어떤 저널리즘의 보편성이 있는 것 같아요. 그게 무엇인지 좀 듣고 싶습니다. Well, first of all, it's one of the great <coughs> joys and surprises of my writing life that Letters to Young Journalist was translated and published here in, in Korea as well as in, uh, in China. I've written eight books. This is the only one of my books to be translated into any other language. And I'm just incredibly moved to find out that the book has had such an effect here. I met my Korean publishers tonight and found out that it's in the seventh printing here, which just astonishes me. I feel like I won't need a plane to get home. I'll just walk on air on the way back. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> But that's a good motherly warning. <laughs> But I think we found that there are a great many things in common. I think, first of all, both of our countries, and I think many countries around the world, feel like they're in a period of deep and intense political debate right now. And they look, hopefully, to journalists, to responsible professional journalists, to be a trusted voice. That if they feel, and this is certainly true in the United States, that the political dialogue of the country is often so poisonous, um, so hard to believe, that there is a desire to find someone who is believable. So I think that's one area of, of common interest between us. The other is that Korea, like the United States, has been very much remade by the digital revolution, by the internet, 
now by social media, by all sorts of platforms. And we don't even know what's going to be invented you know, tomorrow or a year from now. And I think what I've learned in talking to Korean journalists and journalism professors even on this short trip and from some of the questions that uh, came to me from some of you beforehand is that a lot of the challenges that the digital revolution has posed in America are identical to the challenges here. The challenges of what will be the business model for the news industry moving forward. The challenge of what's the point of being a professional, ethical, responsible journalist if anybody can throw up a website or start blogging and pretend to be a journalist. Um, the challenge of sifting through all the information that's out there online and trying to, in a really rigorous way, verify what's truthful and what's not, or what's ha fully true and what's partially true, or what's factually true but presented with a bias. Those are great challenges that I'm now aware we completely share across you know, two continents and with notion dividing us. And maybe it's because the practice of journalism itself, and this is one of the good, very good parts of the digital revolution, has become a truly global conversation. Because we can read each other's work, listen to each other's work, watch each other's work through the miracle of the internet, it gives us a sense that we're in a shared profession facing shared problems, but also with some incredible shared rewards. And it has really erased the miles between us. 그런 기술이 가져다 주는 어떤 공통점도 있지만 아무래도 저널리즘이라는 것이 그 인간이 진실을 추구하고자 하는 본능이 있고요. 또 그것에 그 그것을 위한 그 제가 제일 좋아하는 그책 중에 프레이즈가 저널리스트는 honest broker of information이다. 정, 정직한 브로커다 정보에 그런 정직한 정보를 가져다 주는 사람을 찾는 사회의 속성이 공통이 돼서 그런 게 아닌가 생각이 듭니다. 교수님께서 인간성을 굉장히 그 강조하시는데 그 인간성이라는 것이 사실 나라와 관계없이 그게 다 저널리즘이 추구하는 하나의 목표가 아니기 때문인가 이렇게 생각이 듭니다. 어떻게 생각하시는지요? Well, I completely agree that it's a shared objective for all of us. And when you meet journalists who are trying to do their work in countries around the world that are not free or not fully free, it makes you appreciate how much all journalists look to those of us in free media countries like the United States and Korea or England or France and so on, look to us as beacons for them of what they want journalism in their countries to be. I've had students at Columbia come out of deeply repressive countries, Syria, Iraq, Tajikistan, and some of them have had to go into hiding um, because of their journalistic work. One of my Iraqi students had his father disappeared by a death squad in retaliation for the work he was doing. And that's inspiring, and it lets us know that truly all journalists around the world are part of something larger. And it really unites us at a time when other people would like to pit nation against nation and make it this period of you know, nationalistic antagonism, when I think part of our role is to keep the global conversation going. To go back to your earlier point about being an honest broker, I think that's the great intellectual challenge of being an ethical journalist. And it's a real human challenge as well. It's often human nature to want to be with the people we agree with. It's human nature to want to hear things that we agree with. It's human nature to want to just go on Facebook and put a bunch of likes on things that you like. I understand that. I'm as prone to that human nature as anyone else is. But what the idea of the journalist being an honest broker holds up as a higher value is what if you can lay aside your own beliefs just long enough to hear what somebody else believes. 
and to take it seriously and to treat it honorably. This is a high, high value. Um, it was mentioned that I am a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, and the University of Wisconsin had a great motto that speaks to the same desire to pursue truth wherever it takes you. And you have to understand Wisconsin traditionally is a very agricultural state because this, the metaphor in this phrase has to do with what you do with grain after you've harvested it, okay? To get to the, the kernels of grain, the part that you would make bread and make flour out of. But the University of Wisconsin said that its mission and the mission for its students was to sift and winnow in the pursuit of truth. In other words, there are a lot of ideas out there. There are a lot of pseudo ideas out there. There's a lot of information out there. There are a lot of facts out there. There are a lot of factoids out there. You have to make your way through all that as a journalist and try with great intellectual honesty to find the facts and the truth within it, to resist the urge to only go to an ideological place that's already comfortable to you, or to resist the urge to have your conclusion before you have done any of the research. 자, 제가 어떻게 이 질문 중에 하나에도 그런 게 있었습니다. 어떻게 언론이 정직함을 유지하면서 제대로 보도할 수 있을까? 정직함에 대한 정, 그 질문들이 있었는데 그 제가 사전에 한번 여쭤봤어요. 정직함에 대한 선생님의 생각을 여쭤봤는데 두 가지 레벨에서 말씀하셨습니다. 첫 번째 정직함이라는 것은 you said before 어, 아버지한테 집에서 배우는 부모님한테 배우는 그런 종류의 정직함이 있고요. 또 하나는 이제 사회에 나와서 지금 방금 말씀하신 intellectual honesty라는 말씀을 하셨습니다. 그러니까 지적인 정직함을 우리는 획득해야 한다. 그러니까 기자들 기자라는 직업이 그 지적인 정직함을 추구하면서 치열하게 그것이 무엇인지 고민해야 하는 뭐 거짓말을 하나 안 하나 이런 차원의 거짓말이 아니라 그런 차원의 고민이 아니라 그런 말씀을 해주셨고요. 그 그런 부분은 사실은 뭐. 나라와 문화와 관계없이 또 디지털과 아날로그와 관계없이 이 관통하는 어떤 저널리즘의 기본 덕목이 아닌가 생각을 합니다. 오늘 주제가 디지털 시대의 언론인의 윤리입니다. 그래서 이제, 이제 디지털로 좀 넘어와 볼까 합니다. 디지털 관련해서 많은 그 이야기들을 할수 있을 것 같고 또 질문도 많이 있었습니다. 여러 질문이 있는데 우선 이제 아까 스피치에서 여러 그 half full version and half empty version. And I'd like to ask you, 아, 죄송합니다. <웃음> 그 중에서 가장 큰 위협은 무엇이고 가장 큰 기회는 무엇인지 그거 좀, 그게 좀 듣고 싶어요. 많은 말씀을 하셨는데 선생님께서 생각하시는 그래도 좀 중요한 부분을 정리해서 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. That's a great question. Before I answer that, I just want to also amplify a little bit the point when we had our conversation yesterday about two types of honesty. One type of honesty is your basic character. And this is something that hopefully you learn from your parents or from your teachers or from the minister at your church. Um, and that's the kind of honesty that says you don't steal your brother's allowance money. Um, you don't do what I did in high school, which is put a dent in your father's car, and instead of telling him you did it, try to paint it over and hide it. Um, those are basic kinds of honesty in your character. But, that, but you could be someone who won't steal your brother's allowance and won't lie about putting a dent in the car and still not be intellectually honest as a journalist. Because intellectual honesty as a journalist, as I was suggesting before, has to do with being able to, at times, separate yourself from your own beliefs. A good example is if you take some of the issues that are very divisive in American society, like should abortion be illegal or not? Um, should there be gun control laws or not? Those are issues that really divide the country almost in half, or two-thirds to one-third. And if you're going to be an ethical journalist, even if you're in favor of abortion rights, you have to be able to go out and cover a rally that wants to make abortion illegal and treat the people at that rally honestly. Not just quote them accurately, 
but take their point of view seriously. And the same thing, if you're someone who loves to go hunting and likes to collect guns and thinks that guns are protected by the Second Amendment of the Constitution, and you get sent as a journalist to cover a rally by students like the students in Florida who had a mass shooting at their school demanding very strict gun control, you have to be able to separate your own point of view from theirs. And there's one final level, and then I'll get to the social media part, which is that it's also important to be an ethical journalist not to engage in what I call false equivalency. It is a very high journalistic value to look at both sides or many sides of an issue. But not every issue has two sides. When people, even if it's in public political life, say the people of this race are inferior to another race, that's not an issue with two legitimate points of view. And if you treat it with on the one hand, on the other hand, then you're actually distorting it. Or climate change. You see often American journalists who are not really knowledgeable about science, if they write about climate change, they talk about the scientists who say there is human-caused climate change, and then they'll quote the ones who say, no, this is just a natural cycle. But that's a distortion. That's a false equivalency. Because among climate scientists around the world, the overwhelming majority, well over 90%, say it's caused by human activity. If you write about that 50% pro 50% con, you're not being accurate. You may think you're being fair. You're actually being very inaccurate. So having said that, now to some of the challenges of ethics in the digital era. I talked about a couple of them before, the challenge of verifying, um, the challenge of, um, of resisting the urge to just stay in your own political or ideological corner, or just with people of your own gender, or, or just with people of your own religion, all these different sub-communities that exist, um, especially online. But I want to point, bring up one other point that actually I'd meant to include in my speech, but the text was finished by the time it occurred to me, which is a lot of journalists now get very mixed messages from their newsroom executives. On the one hand, they're told, we want you to have a Twitter account, we want you to be on Facebook, we want you to have a social media platform, and we want you to use it to be part of the public conversation, to promote your work so that people will see our news organization's work on your Twitter feed and start paying attention to our publication as a whole. And on the other hand, these journalists are said, but you can't do anything that is too opinionated or makes it look like you have a bias or is too snarky and insulting to someone else. I think that actually journalists are, I feel very sympathetic to the ones who later get disciplined or reprimanded because many news organizations have been way too slow to develop policies about social media use. But even though I criticize a lot of journalistic managers for that failure, I also think there's still a lot of personal responsibility that belongs to the individual journalist. And what I would say to you, and this is one of the big challenges of the digital era, is that you cannot think that there is a dividing line between your public life as a journalist and your private life as expressed on social media anymore. There is no such line. Everything you put out in social media will be interpreted by the people who follow your journalism as being reflective of you as a journalist and of being reflective of your news organization. You can't say, oh, I didn't mean it. You can't say, oh, that's just my personal account because it's all searchable now. And we know even if you try to delete the tweet, it will be found. Even if you want to say that photo of me giving the Nazi salute at some event, I was just goofing around. That is impossible anymore. And look, we all make momentary mistakes, but I'm a big believer in what my wife calls the 30-second rule. The 30-second rule is when you're starting to get ready to write something or post something online, wait 30 seconds and then think about whether you want this 
to be part of your life for the rest of your life, because it will be. I'm not talking about things you did in high school. I think there is a forgiveness. But once you have started to be a journalist, whether that's in college or after college, everything you put out there is going to be part of how you are assessed as a journalist and whether people think they can trust you. When I go to interview people now, they've checked me out on social media to decide whether they want to give me an interview or not. And that's going to be more and more common. So I think it's hugely important for you to think about that. And I'll say one last thing. So, um, there was a recent incident, the new, actually I'll spare the details, but the larger point I want to make is sometimes journalists who get drawn into you know, Twitter storms you know, and flaming with people, readers who are attacking them, say things they regret. And then when they're called to account about why, if you're one of our reporters, did you say blah, blah, blah? I mean, for instance, there's an excellent journalist in the United States named Julia Iafi. She got very mad because a bunch of Donald Trump supporters were, you know, going after her, were trolling her. They, because she's Jewish, they were sending her cartoons of her dressed like a concentration camp inmate. And so she got so mad, she put out a tweet saying, I think Donald Trump must be sleeping with his daughter Ivanka. They must have an incestuous relationship, which was a disgusting and unforgivable thing to say. And her explanation initially was, well, I was being trolled. I just fought back. And I'm sorry, that is not a legitimate excuse for us anymore. There is no law of nature that if someone trolls you, you have to say anything back to them. There is no law of nature that says that even if someone goes after you because of your religion, your race, your nationality, you have to get into the gutter with them. Um, and I just really want to urge that on you because you as young people who've grown up in the digital era who feel like somehow there's a magic line between your public self and your private self need to be aware that no such line exists. 좋은 조언을 해 주셨어요. 감사합니다. 양쪽을 똑같이 보도하는 게 이게 과연 균형 보도일까라고 고민하셨던 분들이 계실 것 같아요. 그거에 대한 답변도 주신 것 같고요. False equivalent라는 표현을 하셨습니다. 또그 공인이 사적 자리에서 이야기를 할때그 정보 자체가 공적 정보로 되니까 조심해라. 그러니까 언론인의 공적 책임감을 말씀을 하셨습니다. 그 부분도 굉장히 유의해야 될 점이라고 저희가 생각을 하고요. 또 30 second rule도 굉장히 좋, 좋죠. 좋은 정보라고 생각합니다. 많은 그, 그 의문에 답을 주셔서 대단히 감사합니다. 그 청중들이 물어본 몇 가지 질문이 있습니다. 그 특히 이제 인터넷 시대에 접 들어서 뉴스라는 장르 자체가 막 이렇게 변하면서 엔터테인먼트와도 결합을 하고 쇼랑도 결합을 하고 그런 현상에 대해서 어떻게 생각하시는지요? 저널리즘에 어떤 영향을 줄지요? That is a great question, and I think it's a big problem. It's a problem I'm sympathetic to. One reason that news organizations engage in a lot of entertainment is the financial reason. I talked before in my speech about the kinds of advertising and the kind of purchasing a newspaper or a magazine at the newsstand or subscribing to it that provided most of the revenue news organizations needed to operate up until the last 10 or 15 years. Now that revenue stream has, uh, has been disrupted. It will never, I think, get back to what it was. And so news organizations look for different ways to bring in income to make up the loss. And I'm sympathetic because the money that needs to be replaced, that's the money that keeps you paying your investigative reporters. That's the money that keeps you paying your foreign correspondents. That's the money that allows you to have things like, you know, an art critic or a theater critic that really give a news organization great range and great intellectual appeal. The danger, though, is that you start to blur the line between news and entertainment I, in a couple of ways. One is to use, I don't know if you know the term clickbait. 
it's an American slang term. It means putting up something on your website that's really pretty silly, but it'll get a lot of people to click on it. So for instance, videos of cats are big clickbait for American news organizations. And so part of the question is, I don't know if many of you are familiar with BuzzFeed, which is really one of the very exciting startups of the digital era and does some incredible reporting. But BuzzFeed's model is a mixture of things like cat videos and really silly things and also very serious you know, investigative reporting. The question will be how to keep that <clears throat> in proper balance because it's not unheard of at all for newspapers or magazines long before the internet era to have some sillier coverage and some serious coverage. Um, Vanity Fair magazine, for instance, always had this balance between celebrity profiles, so the big article about Tom Cruise or Madonna or Beyonce that gets someone to, to buy the magazine, but then once you've bought it, there'll be a very serious story about, say, the Iraq war. So this isn't just true of the digital era, but I think it's become more pronounced. The other kind of problem with blurring the line is when news organizations begin to put on events to raise money. So a couple of good examples of this are not good, they're vivid and they're kind of disturbing. The New Yorker magazine is my favorite magazine in the world. I think it's extraordinary. But the New Yorker magazine, as part of building its brand and bringing in revenue, does an annual festival with live performances of music and theater and a lot of conversations with important public figures. And you pay tickets. You, you, you pay for your ticket to go to it. Advertisers buy advertisements. So it's a big source of cash for the New Yorker. This year, the New Yorker wanted to invite Steve Bannon to be interviewed on stage by the editor of the magazine, David Remnick. And there was a huge outcry against it by, by staff writers on The New Yorker, as well as by the public. And I thought to myself, why was there such an outcry? And here's what I believe. It's one thing for The New Yorker magazine to say David Remnick or anyone else is going to write an article about Steve Bannon, who as you know, this very controversial, very polarizing figure who was part of the Trump campaign and is now sort of going around Europe trying to build up very nationalistic political parties. And he's an important part of the public life of the United States and much of the world now. You can't ignore him because you disagree with him. And I think that if the New Yorker had said, we're going to have in this issue David Remnick writing about Steve Bannon, no one really would object to it. But the idea that Steve Bannon was being used as a way to sell tickets and make money, and that in fact his very offensive ideas were being used as a form of clickbait, if you want to put it that way, showed some of the problems of a news organization trying to also operate as basically an events company. And I'm sure all of us as journalists followed the terrible news about the murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian journalist who was also a columnist for the Washington Post. And part of what happened right after the murder was Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who is widely believed to have been knowledgeable of the killing if not having ordered it, held his big investment conference in Saudi Arabia. He calls it Davos in the desert. And a lot of people pulled out of it because they didn't want to be associated with his regime now. But I was shocked to see that some of the organizations that were sponsors of it, although they did pull out, were news organizations. The New York Times, um, I believe, I may be wrong, but I think Reuters, I think Bloomberg, and I thought, this is a problem. Why are news organizations, as part of building their brand and indirectly getting revenue, sponsoring basically an investment conference for a particular government? What kind of conflict of interest problem does that pose? Can you possibly report honestly and fairly about a country 
when you're part of trying to generate investment for that country. So these are, you know, not new problems, but new versions of old problems. 그런 그 재정적인 노력, 분투하는 언론인, 언론에 재정적인 노력을 말씀하셨기 때문에 바로, 바로 다음 질문으로 이어질 것 같은데요. 어떻게 그러면은 뉴스페이퍼 인더스트리가 미래에 재정적으로 어, 온전하게 유지되고 또 성장할 수 있는지 그걸 다들 고민하시는 것 같습니다. 그리고 신문의 미래가 어떻게 될지 AI가 쓰는 게 아닐까 우리는 월급을 받을 수 있을까 <웃음> 굉장히 중요한 문제거든요. 또 어떤 질문은 미국에서 어떤 성공한 비즈니스 모델 사례가 있느냐 아까 partial paywall you mentioned about 그런 부분에 대해서 좀 조언을 우리한테 줄수 있는 게 있느냐 그런 얘기들이 있었습니다. 그, 그런 것들을 전부 모아서 이런 신문 산업, 언론 산업의 미래와 재정적인 어, 가능성에 대해서 좀 답변 부탁드립니다. First of all, I have to believe that journalism and news organizations will survive. This isn't the first challenge we've faced. It may seem more severe than others because the digital revolution has changed so much in our two nations and in the world. But if I think about just the short history, the couple of centuries of American journalism, <clears throat> there were challenges from the beginning of radio, from the beginning of TV, from the beginning of cable television. So we've had you know, from the movies. So we've had challenges before and we've surmounted them. But I think it will take a mix of different models in order <coughs> to be successful moving forward. I think one model which you've seen successfully now from some of the large news organizations that I mentioned before, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Wall Street Journal, but also some mid-sized newspapers like the Minneapolis Tribune is a partial paywall. I think what they have figured out is that not enough consumers want a total paywall. They're not going to pay a large amount of money, several hundred dollars a year, and if they don't pay it, get zero access at all. They'll either just try to sneak around the paywall or they'll go somewhere else. The genius of the partial paywall is giving people a few free articles first so they read it and they like it, and then having a very low starting point. As I mentioned in my speech, most of these partial paywalls start out being about $1 a week for the first 10 or 12 weeks you subscribe. The other important thing partial paywalls do is they get you to give your credit card number. <coughs> and as you know, once you've given your credit card number to something and it gets automatically charged, you don't even think of yourself as buying it. It just sort of shows up on your credit card bill at the end of the month. So I think partial paywalls are one option. Another option is to use more um, foundation support and donations even from private individual philanthropists to support news organizations. And what this has tended to mean is not general interest news organizations, but specialized ones. So for instance, in the United States, there's a terrific online only news organization called The Marshall Project. All, of it, all it does is cover issues of criminal justice. There's one called ProPublica that only does investigative reporting. And what they've been able to do is, is successfully appeal to foundations, to individual donors, and sometimes even to individual subscribers to donate money in order to keep going. So they're operating outside the capitalist system. A third <clears throat> option is to rethink the way the journalism market is organized. Traditional newspapers like the Times and the Post, the LA Times, the Dallas Morning News, you name it, and general interest magazines and the big TV networks, I always compare them to department stores. You know what a big department store is like, you still have some. You go into the store, whether it's Macy's or Target or whatever the big stores in Korea are, because you sort of choose that store to do the first wave of shopping for you. If you want to buy a suitcase, you can't look at every suitcase. You look at the 20 suitcases they chose to display. If you want to buy a scarf, you can't look at 10,000 scarves. 
<coughs> you look at the hundred scarves they have, but you trust them. That's the way newspapers and magazines used to be. The, the buyer and the reader trusted the New York Times or the New Yorker or the Atlantic Monthly to offer certain choices. But as you know, being products of the digital era, you want to shop for yourself. You want to look at 10,000 scarves online if you can. You want to look at 1,000 suitcases online if you can. And the same thing in how we access news. So some of the really smart startups in the capitalist um, part of the journalistic market. Ah, thank you. I'm going to pause for just. <clears throat> Some of the exciting startups are, are so specialized that people will pay a fairly substantial paywall to get it. So there will be a website that does nothing but give you the best sports coverage. I subscribe to such a site. It's called The Athletic. What The Athletic realized is a lot of terrific sports journalists were being laid off. They still wanted to write. A lot of local newspapers had cut their sports sections so much they weren't worth reading anymore. So the people at The Athletic said, let's start this up, let's hire these people, and let's find these readers all around the country who may live in a bunch of different places but all share an interest in sports, and we'll give them targeted coverage of their hometown sports teams, as well as general coverage of national sports. The Athletic has become one of the fastest growing news organizations in the United States by being very specialized. And things get far more specialized than that. So I think that's another way. Is instead of trying to be a department store, you try to be a boutique that only carries one thing, but carries a lot of it and knows its product really well. 감사합니다. 좋은 좋은 이셨던 것 같습니다. 저 페이크 뉴스에 대한 질문도 많았어요. Are you ready to talk about fake news? <웃음> 페이크 뉴스의 정의를 물어보는 분도 계셨고 또 우리나라에서 페이크 뉴스를 정부에서 규제하려고 하는데 그거에 대해서는 어떻게 생각하시는지 또 페이크 뉴스를 방지할 수 있는 어떤 저널리스트로서의 장치 같은 게 있는지 그런 것들에 대한 궁금증이 많았습니다. 그 that is such an important question for all of us. The first thing to say is it's so interesting when you realize how the term fake news doesn't mean now what it originally meant. When the term fake news came into use, and I first started seeing it in the 2016 presidential campaign in the United States, it didn't mean news that someone in power disagrees with. It actually meant fake news. It actually meant some of these fake articles that we in the United States now know were put out by the Russian intelligence services or by Russian bots by flooding Twitter accounts. It actually was fake news, something that looked like news but had never actually happened or hadn't happened that way. But very quickly, Donald Trump as a candidate now as president has changed the meaning of fake news and it's become any news that I disagree with, any news that's critical of me, even if it isn't fake, in fact, especially if it's true. And it's been very disturbing that you see all around the world um, autocratic leaders, illiberal leaders using the same term. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uses it in Israel, uh, type Erdogan uses it in Turkey, all around the country, all around the world rather, Autocratic leaders are using this to try to delegitimize um, honorable, respectable, accurate reporting. But there also is this tremendous effort. Sometimes it's just amateurs who are being sloppy, but too often it's people very deliberately trying to flood the media with what is actually fake news or distorted news, or only partially true news, slanted to favor one side or the other. And then the question is, what do we do about it? I think that, at least in the United States, um, the internet and certainly the social media companies have got to be regulated by the government. They haven't been to this point, but there is an important precedent for regulating them. In the 1930s, when radio became the hot new disruptive technology in the United States, 
the United States formed something called the Federal Communications Commission. It was a federal agency that basically oversaw the way radio operated. It later applied to TV as well, but TV didn't really become common until the late 1940s. And what the Federal Communications Commission did was twofold. Number one, it said, you need the air to broadcast your radio and later TV signals. No one can own the air. The federal government controls the air above the United States, and you need our permission to use our public air to broadcast your signal. So we're not going to make you pay money for it, but we're going to make you promise that you will not use your radio stations for ideological indoctrination or for partisan politicking. And there was a rule called the Fairness Doctrine that enforced it. Now, for a variety of reasons, unfortunately, the Fairness Doctrine was struck down, was invalidated in the 1980s. But the idea that the federal government has a right to demand some level of honesty and integrity out of mass media companies is a valuable precedent for what we can do now with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and others. It will not be a perfect solution, but it will be better than just depending on the private sector to police itself. That's where we've been left. We hope, you know, that Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and Jack Dorsey at Twitter will choose to police themselves and to try to find the actual fake news that comes through their platforms. But whether they do or don't, it's solely up to them. They're not required to. We hope they will, but if they don't, there's nothing we can do about it. So that's why I think there has to be a legal structure. And I think that will not stop all of the fake news, but it can only get us to a better place than where we are now. Yes. But fake news is the truth, as you said, 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 만약에 정부가 그 페이크 뉴스를 어, 규제한다고 한다면 그 오해를 받지 않겠습니까? 전체 네. it, 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 it is very misunderstood and that's why I gave that little history of the term because it has come to me now something totally different from what uh, from what it meant initially. It, um, I'll leave it. Yes, yes. 그렇습니다. 방송하고 이제 지금 인터넷상의 페이크 뉴스하고는 좀 다르다는 생각이 들어서 제가 추가 질문을 드렸습니다. 지금 도널드 트럼프 말씀을 하셨기 때문에 조금 더 이제 어, 어, 복잡한 질문을 하나 드리자면 그 미국 사회의 경우에 도널드 트럼프 대통령이 들어선 이후에 미국 사회가 굉장히 어, 분리가 되어 있다. 그래서 굉장히 많은 우려를 갖고 있는 것으로 알고 있습니다. 그리고 우리도 그 문제를 잘 이해합니다. 우리 사회도. 그래서 제가 여쭙고 싶은 것은 어그 이념적인 지향점이 있습니다. 기자들마다 모두 그 이념적인 지향점을 그 저널리즘이라는 직업주의와 어떻게 조화를 이루는 것이 좋은지 좀 어. 복잡한 질문이지만 굉장히 현명하고 명쾌하게 답을 주실 거라고 생각을 하고 여쭙니다. This is a question that every individual journalist has to wrestle with. And I will say this, there is there is and there always has been a totally legitimate place for opinion journalism as part of everything that journalism does. I love reading the op-ed columns in different newspapers and magazines. I love reading knowledgeable opinion writers. So it's not that I'm against opinion journalism at all. But one thing I will say is that I think it's important if you're starting out your journalistic career to not choose to go into opinion journalism right away. I think that the best opinion writers spent a lot of time first as reporters. They didn't just sit down and wrote what they thought about the nation's events or the world events. They went out as reporters and explored what the nation was like, 
what the world was like. They were confronted with people who were different than them. They were confronted with beliefs that were different from their beliefs. And because they were out there as reporters rather than opinion writers, they couldn't just dismiss those people and those beliefs right away and say they're wrong or that's stupid. They had to try to come to terms with it. And I think that that kind of seasoning really helps someone become a better opinion writer. In fact, when I even think about some of the opinion writers who I respect the most, there are two things that I look for. And it's not necessarily who is the best writer from word to word or sentence to sentence. The two things I look for the most are, does this opinion writer still do a lot of reporting? And the second thing I look for is, is this opinion writer somewhat unpredictable? In other words, can I pick up each new column by this writer and not know before I even start it what position this writer is going to hold on every single issue? So even for opinion writing, that need to report, that need to be intellectually open to other opinions, other people, other ways of life, is absolutely essential. 네, 감사합니다. 좋은 답변 감사드립니다. 시간이 거의 다 됐는데 제가 한 가지 제 질문을 드리고 싶습니다. 괜찮겠습니까? <웃음> 그 긴장이 콜롬비아 대학에서도 그 우수 교수로서 상을 받으셨고 또 어, 제가 그 협회 뭐 굉장히 그 유, 유명한 티칭 어워드를 많이 받으셨어요. 여기 저를 포함해서 이제 저널리즘을 가르치시는 선생님들도 여러분 와 계신데 오, 우리 시대에 저널리즘을 가르치는 사람은 어떤 게 가르쳐야 되는지 그런 조언을 좀 주십시오. 저널리즘 티처에게 주는 어드바이스. I learned so much about teaching by watching other great teachers at work. I had extraordinary teachers during my high school and college years, and I have stolen a lot of their best ideas. Um, so I think that's one thing, is if you're learning, if you want to be a great teacher, you have to find great teachers and observe them and learn from them. That's one thing. Another thing to keep in mind is that we have to be models of what we want from our students. I have a reputation of being a very rigorous and tough and demanding teacher, but I also make sure I live up to my own standards. When I have a student come late to my class, and sometimes I lock the door and, and make them wait, but one of the things I say to them is, if you want me to be late, then keep coming late. We, cannot, we can run a class that way if you want, and if you want to sit there all 15 of you and wait 10 minutes after the start of class for me to show up, then fine, we can do it that way. But if I ask you to be on time, it's only because I'm going to be on time. And for instance, if I get every week my written assignments from my students, I promise to them the next week in class, all of your assignments will be edited. Every assignment will be handed back to you. Because if you can't hold up your end, return their work on time, edit it in a thoughtful way and in a helpful way, then you have no right to ask them to make their deadlines. It's constant reciprocity. You can only ask of them what you're giving to them. You have to return to them everything you're asking of them. And then I think there's this balance that we were talking about um, that when we were having lunch the other day that I call Old Testament versus New Testament. So one part of my life as a teacher is like the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, God is always wagging his finger at the, you know, the ancient Hebrews and saying, you're worshiping that golden calf. You're worshiping those idols. You know, you're really messing up. I'm going to make sure that the Babylonians conquer you and take you away. You know, I'm going to visit, you know, terrible things on you because of your iniquities. So that's part of what teaching is. It's calling people out. It's not letting them have it, you know, hand in anything substandard, it's catching every error they make and having zero tolerance for editors. But then there's the New Testament. The New, in the New Testament, Jesus comes along and says it's about love and forgiveness and redemption 
and the possibility of people to change. And that's the other way you have to be as a journalism professor, that if you're going to be tough and demanding and even harsh on your students, they have to know that when they work really hard, even if they fall short, and when they begin to make progress, you will notice that, you will praise them for it, you will let them know that you see the effort and that you see the improvement and that you're rooting for them to make that improvement. So I think those two things have to be together. You can't be all New Testament. You can't just be everything is great, it's wonderful, you're the best students I've ever had and let people get away with being not competent. But you also can't be cruel. There's a way to be demanding and have high standards without being cruel and being heartless. So it can't be one or the other. It has to be a kind of a dialogue between both. 네, 감사합니다. 제가 구약과 성경을 합친 좋은 선생님이 되도록 노력하겠습니다. 네. 자, 시간이 거의 다 됐는데요. 제가 사전에 질문을 저희가 많이 받았고 제가 오늘 이 토크를 좀 준비하면서 질문을 많이 이해하다 늘려고 노력을 했습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 그래도 한몇 분은 질문이 있을 것 같아요. 그래서 한뭐한두분 질문을 받도록 하겠습니다. 플로어에서 질문 있으신 분은 손을 드시고 자기 소속을 밝혀 주시고 어 질문을 해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. We'll take the question from the floor. Okay. 맨 앞에 있는 친구 한 분. 네. 부터 시작할까요? 네. 네. 안녕하세요. 저는 어 이화여대 4학년 프론티어 저널리즘 스쿨 프로... 이화여대요? 네. <웃음> 어 과정을 밟고 있는 조윤하라고 합니다. 어 일단 우선 강연 듣게 돼서 되게 영광이고요. 어그 책에서 책 부분을 좀 질문하려고 하는데 그 냉정한 객관성과 인간과 가슴 사이에서 그 인간은 어차피 주관적이기 때문에 객관성을 유지하기 힘듦으로 공정성이 중요하다라고 하셨는데 어 최근 우리 사회 분위기를 보면 절대 선과 절대 악의 그 경계가 굉장히 모호하다고 생각을 해요. 책에서도 선과 선의 충돌이라고 말씀을 하셨고 그래서 이 상반되는 양측의 이야기를 들어보면 되게 개인적인 공정성을 기준으로 판단하기가 참 힘든 면이 몇몇 있는데 어 혹시 이런 경우 개인적으로 설정해 놓으신 기준이나 아니면 뭐 원칙 같은 게 있으신지 그리고 뭐 이런 걸로 고민하신 적이 있다면 뭐 구체적인 경험까지도 듣고 싶습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Thank you for your great question and for being here. I think that there are two different parts to your question though. If you're talking about right and wrong, what journalists do need to be able to do is at a level of fact things that are provable, be able to step in and say something is right or something, or something is wrong. If the facts contradict what someone tells you in an interview, you should, in, in a way that is not holding them up to ridicule, but is being clear to a reader, say that they said thus, they said this, that, and the other thing, but actually something else is true, if it's actually provably true. Um, but that's not the same as deciding between what's morally right or wrong. And that's where you're quite correct that a journalist has to be humble about not coming in and playing God and saying who's morally correct. There are, that in many parts of human experience, the journalist is in the middle of not an argument between right and wrong, but an argument between two different versions of what's right. When I wrote my book, Jew versus Jew, which was mentioned before, it was all about battles between two versions of what is right. What's the right way to live a Jewish life in America? What's the right relationship for American Jews to have with Israel? What's the right way for a religion that was historically patriarchal to deal with modern feminism? And so that whole book was about not saying this side is right and the other is wrong, it was a way of saying here's a really complicated issue with some people of goodwill and passion on both sides and I'm going to try to be accurate in portraying that argument. But then there are other times where you do need to step in and quote someone, even though someone you spoke to may have been very sympathetic to you, but if they are wrong, 
if they're telling you something that's provably incorrect, then you're failing your reader if you do not correct it when you publish your article. Because we think a lot, as we should as journalists, about the morality of how we deal with our sources and our subjects. And it is moral. We have to feel that our morality is at stake in dealing ethically with the people we report upon. But we also have an obligation to our readers. And our obligation, I always tell my students, your obligation to the people we interview is to be accurate in reporting what they've said, to treat them respectfully, to take seriously what they've said. But that obligation to the source cannot take precedence, cannot be a higher value than your value to the general public. Because if you were trying to just be nice and friendly and supportive in a personal way to someone you've interviewed, and that leads you to not be as accurate and truthful and factual as possible to your public, then you're failing at the larger task. And that larger task is, as journalists, we have a big part in the way democratic societies function. And I don't care if certain people in my own country disparage that now. I totally believe that's a vital role for us to play. And if we start to, um, to alter what we write or broadcast for the public only because of it makes us feel like we've been you know, kinder to a source, then we're still failing. 네, 감사합니다. 또 다른 질문 있을까요? 이번에는 한번 저 뒤로 가볼까요? 남자, 남학생 한번 해볼까요? 남, 남자분? 저기? 네. 죄송합니다. 한번. 손을 많이 드시네요. 이거 어떡하죠? 네, 고맙습니다. <웃음> 학생은 아니고요. JTBC에 근무하는 박민규 기자입니다. 그 이렇게 young 기자들... Young journalist, young journalist네요. 예, 네. 기자들 그리고 예비 기자들 많이 모여 있는데 질문 한두 개로는 사실 교수님 끝나지 않을 것 같다는 말씀 미리 경고를 드려야 될것 같고요. 어 제가 궁금한 건 계속해서 뉴스페이퍼에 근무하신 걸로 알고 있기 때문에 I'll, I'll come back. 예, 그래서 TV, 텔레비전 뉴, 네 다시 오시면 또 여쭈도록 하겠습니다. TV 뉴스에 대해서 좀 여쭈고 싶습니다. 뭐 대한민국 많은 방송사들이 그렇고 제가 지금 근무하고 있는 JTBC라는 회사도 그런데요. 어 기자의 얼굴 또는 앵커의 얼굴이 오래 나오면서 기자가 직접 등장해서 설명하고 직접 현장에서 전하는 방식의 리포팅을 많이 하고 있습니다. 근데 이게 어떤 시청자들 입장에서는 조금은 정제되지 않은 정보를 실시간으로 전달한다는 그런 목적 때문에 조금 정신이 없다 이렇게 보는 사람들도 있고 어떤 사람들은 라이브 방송의 묘미를 잘 살린다 또 기자가 직접 자기 얼굴을 걸고 설명해 주니까 조금 더 신뢰가 간다 이렇게 받아들이는 그러니까 시청자들 평가가 좀 상반된다고 저는 느끼거든요. 이 부분에 있어서 그러니까 TV 뉴스에서 기자나 앵커가 직접 나와서 설명하는 부분이 특히나 디지털 시대에 좀더 많아져야 한다고 혹시 생각을 하실지 또는 어 모르겠습니다. 앵커나 방송 기자를 해보신 적이 없으시기 때문에 조금 다르게 생각하실 수도 있을 것 같아요. 그 부분에 대해서 의견 좀 여쭙겠습니다. Well, it's very common in the United States too for broadcast journalists to have their faces on TV, and I've, although I've not done broadcast journalism myself, I have many, many, many students who have gone into broadcast journalism, so I have a lot of familiarity. And most of them are shown um, with their faces on TV, so I have no ethical problem with that. I think the more interesting issue you raised is, and it's not just true of live TV, it's now true of all journalism because it gets published online so quickly, is keeping the balance between, as I said in my speech, getting the story correct and being the first one to upload it, or in your case, to go on the air with it. And I completely understand the pressures. It's a super competitive business. It's more competitive now than ever before. Everybody wants to be the first one to have it. But if you are first and keep getting things wrong, even if it's an innocent mistake, an honest error, eventually you begin to destroy the trust of your audience. And being first is not worth that because you'll have less of an audience left to watch you being first if they decide that you're not reliable. And I think this is one of the big struggles 
for executives in the news industry is executives really have to decide what standards they will set about when to put through a broadcast or an article or look these days a lot of news gets live tweeted you know how quickly will you put out a tweet about something how much verification do you want it um, to have do you are you willing to have your reporters put unedited content out there right away uh, simply because it might be their first that can be very risky I remember a few years ago there was a major Supreme Court decision in the United States, it had to do with whether the Supreme Court was going to strike down the health care program that President Obama had created. And all the major news organizations wanted to cover the announcement of the decision. And the way it works is the decision is written and it's handed out or put online at the exactly the same time for all the journalists to have access to. And a number of news organizations made a mistake. They read the beginning, like the first five pages or so of a 25-page decision, and they said, aha, the health care plan program has been struck down by the Supreme Court. But it wasn't. It was a two-part decision. And one part of the law was struck down, but the second more important part was upheld. And a lot of these journalists were so concerned about being first, they didn't even read all 25 pages of the decision. And then, of course, they were very embarrassed. But that's what we have to struggle with. It's, I think it's a message news executives have to give their staff, but it's also on the conscience of every you know, individual reporter who has to say, even when there's pressure from an editor, I haven't read the whole decision yet. I'm sorry, I can't write my tweet yet because I don't know everything the court ruled. 네. 대답이 되셨나요? 네. 아유, 이거 어떻게 <웃음> 차례대로 가 볼까요? 저기. 네, 앞에. Hi, uh, my name is Renee from Herald Business. Um, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful speech. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so I felt like I was in back in college for a second. <laughs> um, first of all, um, I would like to ask you about the uh, portal system right now. So the digital era, uh, we can't really deny the impact of portal website in the digital era and... Well, by portal, do you mean like an aggregator? I'm just not sure. Um, we'll say like Google or... Oh, I mean, okay, yeah. so, okay, I got it. Yeah, but uh, in Korea, there is a Korean version of Google called Naver, and it's basically being a main platform, news platform for all the readers. So new readers mostly choose Naver to read news and all the stories. Uh, including me, I don't go any other news website. But when I was when I was in the states, I choose uh, each newspaper website to read stories. But in Korea, it doesn't work that way. So, what would you say about the role of the portal website here, and well, how would you cope with this? Thank you. It's a great question, and the portal problem exists in the U.S. also. I mean, on my smartphone, I didn't even ask for it. I get Google News. Um, my wife actually likes to get a lot of her news that way. She puts in certain preferences, like an RSS, like you would with an RSS feed. And obviously the problem with the portals is that none of that income goes to the news organization that does the reporting. So I think there are two possible ways out of it. One is that at some point, news organizations are going to have to get into serious, difficult negotiations with portals like Google, or Yahoo, or neighbors here, and actually say, we're going to restrict our content, for, we're providing our content to you, unless some kind of revenue stream is set up, unless you license it in some way. Um, because it just can't be that all the advertising dollars go to the portal, because that's where the eyeballs are, but what brought the eyeballs to the portal was the work that the journalists uh, the news organization did, and their news organization isn't making that revenue. Another dream I have, and it's just a dream, but I hope it comes true someday, is I don't know how familiar all of you are with sort of the history of music piracy online and, and um, iTunes, 
which is, was created by Apple. So if you go back, say, 15 years or so, you had programs like Napster and BitTorrent that you could use to basically steal songs for free. You could you know, download them for free illegally. And it was very hard to crack down and who wouldn't want you know, a bunch of their hit songs for free? But it was creating a financial crisis in the recording industry. And I don't mean just for the big conglomerates like Sony or you know, EMI. I mean for individual musicians, songwriters, producers who you know, weren't getting the royalties they would normally get when their music is purchased. And so what Apple came in and did is create iTunes, which is basically this interface, and they worked with the recording companies to license songs, or whole albums in some cases, to iTunes. And then they basically went out to the public and essentially said, look, we know you've been stealing a lot of music. We know basically you're not a bad guy or a bad girl. You really don't want to break the law all the time, do you? If we could set up a way that's not that expensive and you could get your music for a moderate price and be obeying the law, wouldn't you rather do that? And basically it worked. It didn't put an end to music piracy, but it created a system in which m most music listeners, at least the ones I'm familiar with, are willing to give their credit card to iTunes, buy their music there, and then that income goes to support the musicians, the songwriters, the producers, the sound engineers, etc. Because otherwise, eventually, you don't have any music being made anymore. And I keep waiting for there to be something like that for news content. Because I recognize what's very different, and this goes back to my idea about the department store model. If most people like my children's age, they're like your age, they're 26 and 24, they don't think of walking into a department store called the New York Times or Rolling Stone or Vogue or Sports Illustrated the way I used to do. They think of searching for news coverage on a specific thing. I want to see a story about the California wildfires. I want to see a story about, um, you know, about the Chinese party conference. I want to see a story about the FIFA championship. They don't care particularly which one it is. So I think we need to create a site and maybe one of you will be the person to invent it and get rich, I hope so. In which, just like on iTunes, you can search anything you want. You could enter in a search and say, I want all the stories about, you know, about the earthquake today, whatever earthquake it might be. And it'll then load them all in. Here's the earthquake story from the New York Times. Here's the earthquake story from Asahi Shimbun. Here's the earthquake story from you know, the Times of India. Here's the earthquake TV broadcast from BBC. Choose whichever one you want to buy, click on it, pay a qu 25 cents or whatever, and then at least you're, <clears throat> you're creating a revenue stream and you're also kind of educating consumers to behave in a different way. I don't think it's faded that consumer behavior has to always be, let me see where I can get it for free. I think if you, it's a, but it is a market question. It's what's the price point that someone would be willing to pay? And it's a technology question of how can you make it easily accessible so it's not onerous to find it? But that's my other hope. Meng uh, uh Sky News United Kingdom. First of all, I'd like to extend my debate. Uh, thanks to your insightful you know, presentation regarding uh, freedom of the uh, press. Uh, it's a thousand pities that uh, you know, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered by dictator regime in Saudi. And uh, a lot of uh, journalists participated in delivering uh, true <coughs> you know, news to the public for the purpose of uh, public interest. In this time, under this kind of uh, currencies, it's a thousand pities that you know, a dictator regime tried to kill some of the uh, civic activists. In this point, how can we defend ourselves from the uh, threat of uh, dictator government and dictatorship? Thank you. 
That is a profound and really difficult question because there are different levels of protection. I mean, as we've seen in a number of countries around the world, it's actual physical danger. And I have to say, even in the United States, something I never thought I would ever see, you have reporters who've been singled out by name by President Trump who now need bodyguards to do their work. Um, who, I, I don't know this yet, but I will not be surprised if we find out that some of them are wearing bulletproof vests, ultimately. But the idea that journalists have to have bodyguards now in the United States is mind-boggling. Um, so that's one level of threat. The other is the threat of, you know, in, in unfree countries of having your license taken away, of having your publication censored of shut down or shut down, ultimately perhaps to being jailed. So something that stops short of actually physically killing you, but puts tremendous pressure on you not to be able to do your work. And we don't have a great answer to that, to be honest. There are some very good NGOs around the world, like the Committee to Protect Journalists, that try to advocate in these cases. And often journalists are defended by groups like Amnesty International or Freedom House or Human Rights Watch. But those are really just acts of persuasion. And some governments reach the point where the last thing they care about is what some NGO is, is complaining about. And then you go further, and we're in this era of non-state actors, too, that as you know, dangerous as some governments are in their attitudes and actions towards journalists, then you think of large parts of the world that are not governed by anything resembling an actual government. Um, so you think of periods when Al-Qaeda or ISIS um, are controlling large areas of territory, and no journalist is safe there for a second. And if a journalist is taken captive, it's not like you can go to the Al-Qaeda embassy and you know, put in a diplomatic complaint. Who are you going to even talk to about it? So, you know, and, and the other interesting thing, I remember some of the insurgent groups of the 1960s, and whether you're thinking about like the Tupamaros in Uruguay or um, the, um, well, not the Red Army faction, they were, they were pretty horrific all around, but the Viet Cong in Vietnam. Interestingly, those groups saw journalists as potentially ways to get their story out to the wider world. I don't think that they were lovers of the free press, but I also, think at that time the first move they would make wouldn't be to execute somebody. And yet we've seen in the case of so many journalists, the immediate decision is to execute. And sometimes it's a, you know, a kind of a political or theological um, terrorism of, of Al-Qaeda or ISIS of sort. But if you think in Mexico, where there have been a great many journalists murdered, it's really solely about profit. It's about the profitability of the drug cartels. And the drug cartels see investigative reporting as being a threat to their business. And so for them, you know, it's a good business decision to murder a reporter because what other reporter is going to think about doing an investigation of, you know, the Jalisco cartel after the last one got, got beheaded? So it's, and, and this is also, this is the last thing I'll say. This is why it's so destructive when you have the President of the United States, supposedly the leader of the free world, leading attacks on journalists. It's not a joke. I don't think you realize that. It isn't a joke. It isn't just something that plays to his voters in the United States. It's a message that goes all around the world and that endangers journalists and journalism everywhere because every other ruler Every other terrorist leader, every other head of a criminal cartel thinks that if the President of the United States can make threats against individual journalists, then it surely is open season on them. Thank you. Let's go to the next one. Yes, I'm Bejunu. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. I'm a journalist. 
그 이런 일반적인 원칙이나 어떤 저널리즘에 대한 강연 너무 감명 깊게 잘 들었는데요. 사실 한국에서 저널리즘 환경에서 어떤 이런 저널리즘을 가르치는 거에 있어서는 사실 좋은 교수님도 많이 계시고 이런 스쿨들도 있지만 사실 현장에서 이런 신입 기자들에 대해서 선배 기자들이 실질적으로 교육을 하고 저널리즘을 가르쳐야 되고 어떤 기사 실습을 해, 시켜야 되는 상황인데요. 그래서 저희도 뭐 다음 달이면 또 신입이 새로 들어오는데 이런 거에 있어서 실질적으로 좀 교수님께서 저널리즘 스쿨에서 이렇게 시, 새로운 어떤 기자들 혹은 기자 지망생들을 가르치실 때 진짜 단기적으로 혹은 핵심적으로 이것만은 정말 좀 인지했으면 좋겠다라고 중점적으로 가르치시는 게 어떤 게 있는지 궁금합니다. That's a great question. I think there are two ways to answer it. One is what you're describing about is a kind of an informal mentoring process in which more experienced journalists in the newsroom will take the younger ones under their wing. And I think that requires two parties, though, to be interested in it. It's not just the older journalist, the more experienced journalist wanting to be a mentor. It also requires the younger journalist to be humble about realizing I have something to learn from these older people. And I remember very clearly the first newspaper I worked on um, for a summer job. It was my first paying journalism job. And there were a lot of very young people in the newsroom. I was 19 years old. I was a summer intern. But a lot of the full-time reporters were just out of college, 21, 22 years old. And then there were a lot of reporters who at that time seemed very old. Now that I'm 63, they seem young. But then they seemed old because they're probably 50, 55 years old. And it's tempting to think that they're the old timers. What could they know? Why do we need to pay attention to them? And one of the really important realizations some of us young reporters came to is that some of those older reporters were incredible sources of wisdom. It wasn't just specific skills they had. It was something deeper than skills. It was wisdom and judgment and temperament and perspective. And we had some really interesting, you know, friendships almost, but mentoring relationships that spanned sometimes 25 or 30 years. But both sides of that age divide have to be willing to do it. You know, you can't have the older person saying, oh, these millennials, what do they know? And you can't have the younger person thinking, those, you know, those old people in the newsroom, you know, like they grew up before there was even the internet. You know, what do I have to learn from them? So both parties have to be willing. But then institutionally, News organizations have to realize that, that even after you've hired someone, or even after people have been on your staff for a long time, continuing education is vital. Doing staff development, staff retraining, and morale building is vital. And, and unfortunately, a lot of news organizations in the US have stopped doing that, not because they don't want to, but they feel like we're cutting our budget, something has to be cut, let's cut some of those staff development workshops we used to do. And I just think that's a case of doing something that saves money in the short term, but is harmful in the long run. Because if you develop better journalists, you'll have a better product, and I think a better product will always do better in the marketplace. But this is, again, something that has to be taken on by newsroom executives. They have to be the ones to decide it's really important to do this. And it doesn't have to be a huge time commitment. I happen, for a variety of reasons, to be very close to the editors on the Minneapolis Tribune, which I mentioned before. And they're very committed to doing staff development still. And it's not a big expensive thing, but it's one afternoon a week, I think it's every Wednesday at noon, for an hour. They have they get a brown bag lunch in their conference room with a different guest speaker talking on a different topic. And some of it is about practical skills, and some of it is about building morale and keeping people interested and excited. And it can't cost them that much money to do it. So you have some people not out reporting for that hour, and you buy a dozen people sandwiches. It's not all that much money, but I think the payoff is very large. And yet, unfortunately, a lot of news, or news organizations have looked at things like that as a place where they can cut a little bit out of their budget. 
다들 돌아가셔서 이 정보를 이제 저 쉐어하시기 바랍니다. 지금 제가 여러분들 가지고 계신 타임테이블은 제가 8시 반에 이 행사를 마치기로 되어 있습니다. 지금 거의 9시가 다 됐어요. 이제 슬슬 끝내야 돼요. 지금 질문들이 너무 그 진지하고 좋은 질문들이 많아서 하나만 더 받아도 될까요? 질문 하나만 하나만 짧은 질문 하나만. 어, 고려대학교에 있는 교수 박재영이고요. What are the beauties of the New York Times? <웃음> What are the beauties of the New York Times? What are the beauties of the New York Times? When I first got on the New York Times in 1981, oh, let me say one thing first. After the last question, I have to quickly do one more thing for you all. It will require me to briefly walk to the front table there and get something that I want to show to you. So just allow me to do that at the very end. When I first got on the New York Times in 1981, I had never been around a newspaper that took history so seriously. The other newspapers I'd been on, I'd been on four other, this was my fourth newspaper, were very good at reporting events as they happened, but rarely did they stop to put them in historical context. That was the first thing I noticed about the New York Times that made it different. In almost every story, I wrote or anyone else wrote, you'd have to at least devote a paragraph to trying to put the event in some kind of larger perspective, some kind of historical context. So that was number one. And the other thing that really struck me is, and I think these are still true to this day, is a lot of great journalists are only interested in journalism. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's limited. I think the world is a lot bigger than that. And At the New York Times, I suddenly was in a newsroom where I would hear two copy editors arguing about how about the quality of a particular French film, or how good a play on Broadway was, or was the writer Lillian Hellman a, a Stalinist or wasn't she a Stalinist? And I just thought, wow, I'm in a newsroom where people are talking about, you know, arts and culture and you know, art exhibits and everything. And I realized that was part of what made it a great paper. And even just last week, when I was talking to my ethics class last Friday, and I'm leaving tomorrow to go back to New York to teach this Friday, I was saying to them the same thing. We, we happened to get on the subject, oh, I'd seen a play. There's a great play in New York about an argument between a, a writer for a magazine who has fabricated some facts In, in an article and the fact checker who catches him. It's a great place. So I was talking about it to my class and I said, you know, you can't just consume journalism if you're going to be a great journalist. You have to read novels. You have to see plays. You have to listen to music. You have to go to art museums. You have to open yourself up to everything to be inspired and to feel all the richness of human nature and all the complexity of the human condition. And that was something I felt at the times that I had not felt at other places. And Um, I think that it is still true there. I hope so. I mean, I'm not in the newsroom every day, so I can't tell you for a fact, but I certainly pray that it's so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's hard, but we have to finish up here. Do you want to show something? Do you want to show something? Do you want to show something? This is my special purchase from today. <laughs> <laughs> This is not fake news. <laughs> This is not a fake hat. Thank you all so much. 네, 감사합니다. 뭐저큰긴 말은 필요 없는 것 같고요. 편지가 오면 반갑죠. 근데 그 편지를 쓴 분이 직접 오면 얼마나 더 반갑겠습니까? 그런 반가움을 가지고 제가 오늘 행사를 진행을 했습니다. 어, 사실 피드만 교수님 이번에 한국에 처음 오시는 것이고 또 분위기가 너무 진지해서 제가 이 얘기를 잘못 드렸는데 바로 엊그제 오셨고 수업 중에 오셨기 때문에 학기 중에 내일 가십니다. 그러니까 오늘의 이 행사만을 위해서 뉴욕에서 오신 거예요. 어, 그래서 오늘 이 주신 많은 메시지 안에는 우리가 그동안 고민했던 많은 것들이 들어있고 앞으로 더 고민해야 될 
됐고도 들어 있습니다. 제가 가장 좋은 기뻤던 것은 이 안에서 우리가 저널리즘의 기본을 다시 확인하고 또 희망을 어, 봤다는 데 있었던 것 같습니다. 제 수업보다 너무 진지하고 분위기가 좋아가지고 <웃음> 너무 제가 어, 오늘 오신 분 여러분들에게 감사드리고 가장 무엇보다도 먼 길을 오늘 이 자리만을 여러분들을 위해서 와주신 우리 프레드만 교수님께 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드립니다. 네. 감사합니다. 감사합니다. And my hand and thanks, I bow to you.